Good morning and welcome to Boko School Academy. I'm your teacher, Wamaya Kevin, taking you through biology form one. And today's topic, you are going to study about uh, cell physiology. Cell physiology. So today's topic is cell physiology, and we want to know what is the cell physiology. As we started earlier on the introduction to biology, there's a subtopic that was called a cell. And you say that a cell is the structural and functional unit of living organism. And we had two <coughs> different types of cells. Where we have an animal cell, we had an animal cell and a plant cell. So today we are going to discuss in general what is the cell, and what the main functions of the cell and how the cell is made up of. So we start through the, we go straight, we go straight to the definition of the cell physiology. And the cell physiology is the study and the functions of the different parts of the cell. It's the study, right? It's the study and function of different parts of a cell. It's the study and function of different parts of a cell. As you know, when we, are, we discussed the parts of a cell under a light microscope. We had light microscope and electron microscope. Where you say that uh, electron microscope had uh, a high resolution High, high resolution power on a cell than uh, a light microscope. Than light microscope. So those resolution powers, it, is a, it, be, it was able to distinguish between the structures that are closely similar. But when you're using resolution power, the structures come out to be different. When you're using what? Electro, electron microscope. E.g., we can take an endoplasmic reticulum. We have two types of endoplasmic reticulum. We have smooth endoplasmic reticulum and rough endoplasmic reticulum. When you see them at the light microscope, you cannot tell the, light micro the rough and smooth, but you are using an electron microscope, you can be able to do what? To know the difference. So we go to the structure of the cell membrane. Structure of the cell membrane. Structure of the cell membrane. the structure of the cell membrane. When you look at the cell under the electron microscope, sorry, light microscope, you can only be able to, to observe three structures under light microscope. You're observing an animal cell. Where you are going to have a nucleus. This would be a nucleus, nuclear. Then you have cell membrane, cell membrane. Then here, we are going to have cytoplasm. So these are the only structures you can observe in an animal cell while using a light microscope. So here we only want to discuss, when we talk about structure of the cell membrane, we only want to discuss this one, the cell membrane only. This part, only the cell membrane. How it's made up and the function of what? The cell membrane. So the cell membrane, they are thin. Number one, so cell membrane, they are what? They are thin. The cell membrane, they are thin. The, the reason why they are thin, so that they are able to pass small particles or small molecules inside the cell and faster. They are able to pass the molecules or uh, particles inside the cell faster. That, will, that means that uh, the rate of diffusion will be high when they, they are thin. Number two, are also told they are made up of phospholipid layer. It's made up of double layer. Made up 
of double double layer. The cell membrane, we are discussing the cell membrane, and we say it's made up of double layer or bilayer. Double layer or bilayer. Double layer or bilayer. That means that this double layer, number one, it has phospholipid layer, and number two, it has protein layer. So this double layer into bracket, we say it has what? Phospho lipid layer and protein layer. So the cell membrane, this cell membrane here, is made up of two layers, or is composed of phospholipid layer and protein layer. And uh, let us do the structure. The structure, let us draw the structure of a cell membrane, how it looks like when observed in a microscope. So this one is the protein layer, protein layer. And this one you have our phospho. Phospholipid layer. So this is the structure of the cell membrane. This is how the cell membrane looks like. It has a protein layer and it has phospholipid layer. And also it has some pore. Pore are those tiny openings found on the cell membrane. The main function of the pore is to allow particles or molecules or nutrients or water to enter inside the cell and to come out from the cell. That's the, the function of what? Pores. There are tiny openings, holes. There are holes to enable what? Movement of materials in and out of, of the cell. So the lipid material is arranged in two thin outer layers. The lipids material, the phospholipids meaning it has what? Lipids. It's arranged in two thin outer layers. Protein part is found scattered inside this double layer of lipids. So protein, you can see, they are not closely packed. They are distant. So they are scattered within the what? The phospholipid layer. So when you talk about the cell membrane structure of the cell membrane, when you hear the word structure, it means that uh, it's something that you can see. Like if we are being asked, what the structure? What the structure of the duster that I'm using? You, you talk about the shape, and uh, you talk about the, also the length. That's what you mean by what? The structure, something that you can see. So when you observe the structure of a cell membrane under a microscope, you'll be able to see it has a protein layer that looks like this, it has phospholipid layer, and it has what? Tiny openings, and they are termed as pores. And I said the main function of the pores is to allow movement of material in and out of the cell. In and out of the cell. Allow movement of material in and out of the cell. So you go to the functions of the cell membrane. The main function, main function of cell membrane The main function of cell membrane, if you are asked the exam, give the main function of the 
cell membrane. It is simple. You see, it allows movement of material in and out of the cell. It allows movement of material in and out of the cell. You can also say cell membrane are important because they separate cell content from its surrounding. They separate cell content from its surrounding. They separate cell content from its surrounding. So they separate cell content from its surrounding. From its surrounding. And also you can say controls movement of material. Not control. Movement controls movement of materials in and out of the cell. Controls movement of material in and out of the cell. So material for the materials to enter inside the cell and the material to go out of the cell. Like for an example, we have the diagram here. Materials from the surrounding here is where you have what our surrounding. So the material are going to enter through the cell membrane. For an example, we take water. And also some excess water or some waste products are also going to diffuse out of the cell through the cell membrane. So here the arrow, the first arrow A is pointing there, is showing the direction of material inside the cell. And the second arrow, arrow B, is showing the direction of materials from out the, out the cell. And you're being told from this point, they separate the cell content from its surrounding. Cell content from its surrounding. For an example, if we look at the general structure of the cell, general structure of the cell, and it's inside the cell, we have organelles, cell structures. And then the function, the name of the, the inside the cells, what we have? Cell organelles. Uh, E.g., number one, we have nucleus. We might, in the animal cell, we might have, we ha also have uh, mitochondria. We have cytoplasm here. We have ribosomes. We, ha we have uh, Golgi apparatus. We have a uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. So inside the cell, we have what? Cell organelles. And uh, if you see you know, a plant cell, plant cell has a chloroplast, and chloroplast is made up of double membrane. It's made up of double membrane. That is outer membrane and inner membrane. The inner membrane is what we call the cell membrane. And the function of this cell membrane, it separates, you are being told here, they separate the cell content from its surrounding. For an example, I'll show you another diagram. On another diagram, the cell, a general cell. Here, we have chloroplast. We have nucleus. We have mitochondria. So you see, inside the mitochondria, Respiration is taking place. Inside the mitochondria, respiration is taking place. Inside the chloroplast, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is taking place. So you see, chloroplast has a cell membrane. Mitochondria has a cell membrane. That means that whatever reaction is taking place, inside the mitochondria. Anything that take, any reaction that takes place inside the mitochondria does not mix with the, any reaction that is taking place inside the chloroplast. That's why you have what? The differences. The differences, it is one cell, but the reaction that is taking place inside the cell are different. We have photosynthesis taking place inside the cell, and we have respiration taking place inside the cell. All of them are being separated from mixing. Respiration cannot mix with photosynthesis because we have what? A cell membrane. So here, res respiration takes place. What is respiration? It's the chemical breakdown of substrate. 
in the body cells to release energy. You must say in the body cells because respiration only takes place inside the body cells. Aided by what? An organelle, cell organelle called mitochondria. Number two, we also have photosynthesis. It's in the cell. So photosynthesis, the food is being produced and respiration, energy is being produced. So the food being produced does not mix with the reaction of respiration. Why? Because they are separated by what? A cell membrane. That's why I told you here, function, they separate the cell content from its surrounding. Properties of cell membrane. We go straight to the properties of cell membrane. Properties of cell membrane. What do, what do you understand by the term properties? Properties. Properties is the same as behavior or characteristics of cell membrane. Number one, we, we they say it is semi-permeable. Number one, characteristic one, it is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable also means selectively. Selectively permeable. Selectively permeable. So, when you talk about semi-permeable, it's either, we say permeable or semi-permeable. Permeable, it is something that has big pores, that it can enable big molecules or particles to move across or to go through. But semi-permeable, it only allows small particles or molecules to pass through, and big or large molecule does not pass through. So under here you say, cell membrane only allows small particles, stroke molecules, to pass through while large molecules does not pass through. Does not pass through. So the ability of cell membrane to allow small particles to move across to, to pass through. It is called what? Semi-permeable or selectively permeable. Now, it only selects those particles that are too tiny or too small to pass through. Well, those particles that are too big or too large, they cannot pass through. That's why it's called selectively permeable or semi-permeable. Number two, it is said it's sensitive to change in pH and temperature. Sensitive to change in pH and temperature. Sensitive to change in pH and temperature. When you talk about pH, it's either a substance is acidic or alkaline. The acid is a base. That's what you mean the, time, the meaning of word pH and temperature is either the temperature is too low or the temperature is too high. And the instrument used to measure temperature is called thermometer. And you have different types of thermometers. So when you talk about the sensitive to change in pH and temperature, it means when the pH is extreme, when you put a cell membrane and you subject it into a high pH, that means on a, under high acid, when the solution is too acidic, it's going to be denatured or it's going to be destroyed. Same if you place it in a pH that is more basic, it's also going to change the shape. And if we take a cell membrane 
and you subject it under high temperature. Remember, cell membrane is saying it's made up of what? Protein. Protein layer. And you know what you take a protein layer and you subject it to what? To high temperature. Melting will take place. So it will melt. And if you take it to a low temperature, it will start doing what? Freezing. Whereby now the pores of the cell membrane will do what? Will close. So if you take it to low temperature, freezing will take place. And the particles, these pores, sorry, these pores are going to be closed. Why? In solid, because now the solid, in solid form, you are being told that the particles are closely packed. So there will be no what? Air spaces. But if you subject it under the high temperature, it's going to deform, change the structure. So under that on the notes, you can say high temperature, high temperature, and pH. High temperature and pH alters. High temperature and pH alters the shape. of the cell membrane. Alters the shape of the cell membrane and hinders stroke stops cell functions. So what the cell membrane structure is deformed it changed the shape. For an example, if this is the actual shape of our cell membrane, looks like this, then you subject it under high temperature. For an example, it becomes what? Flaccid or crenated. What's going to happen that now the functions are going to be reduced. The functions of the cell membrane are going to be reduced to be, or to be slowed down or definitely can be done what? Can be stopped. And when the cell membrane has stopped allowing water in and out of the cell, it means that the physiological processes are not going to take place, or the reaction inside the cells are not going to take place. That's what we mean by what? Sensitive to change in pH and temperature. Then another one, it is polarized. Number three. Number three property, it is polar. It is polarized. It is polarized. What's the meaning of the word polarized? Polarized means that it has both positive and negative charge. It has positive terminal and negative terminal. So when it has positive and negative charge, it means that uh, it is able to detect, to detect changes of an environment. And uh, under that we say, Cell membrane has a net positive charge inside and a negative outside. This ability, this property, enables it to detect changes in environment. When you talk about that the property enables it to detect changes in an environment, it means that uh, the cell membrane is able to know if the environment, the surrounding environment, it is, if the solution is hypertonic or hypotonic or also isotonic. Hypotonic is when the solution is less concentrated, e.g. distilled water. And a hypertonic solution is when the solution is highly concentrated. That means the solute has been added to the solution. When the solute has been added to solution, we say that the solution is what? Hypertonic or highly concentrated. For the, for the cell membrane to detect changes 
in the surrounding. Example of these changes, example of the changes that the cell membrane can detect of the surrounding, we have temperature, we have pH, and also we have what? The, the solution surrounding what? The cell membrane. Another, another, we go to another subtopic, we go straight to the physiological processes. Physiological processes. So up to that point, the learner, you should be able to answer the question, the following questions like uh, properties of cell membrane, structure of the cell membrane. You can be also be able to draw a well-labeled diagram of what? The structure of the cell membrane. Also another question, Alana should be able, should be able to answer the main functions of the cell membrane. As we said, allows water and, and mineral salts in and out of the cell. Another point we say also the function of cell membrane, it separates the content of the cell from mixing with the other, from mixing with the surroundings. E.g. we took an example of mitochondria and chloroplast, and we say that in the mitochondria, respiration is taking place, and in chloroplast, photosynthesis is taking place. All of these are taking place in one cell. So if they are taking place in one cell, that means that uh, the cell membrane ensures that the content of respiration and the content of photosynthesis does not mix. So you go to the properties of, I've already done properties of cell membrane, you go to the phys physiological processes. Physiological processes. Physiological processes. When we talk about physiological processes, these are the processes that enables the cell to function properly. E.g., we want to know how the cell enters, how the water enters the cell, how the particles enter the cell. So we have three main physiological processes. There are three main physiological processes. Number one, we have diffusion. Number one, we have the, there are three. They are three. So number one, we have diffusion. Number two, we have osmosis. And number three, we have active transport. We have active transport. Curve diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So we want to start with what? Diffusion. We start with the first physiological process called diffusion. So for proper functioning of the cell, we need physiological processes. And we said there are three in number. So diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. And we're going straight away to the diffusion. So first, you want to know what is diffusion. And definitely we start with what? Definitions. Definition of diffusion. So, what is diffusion? The movement of particle. Is the movement of. Is the movement of particles, from a region of high concentration. Is the movement of particles of a substance. is the movement of particle of a substance from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration of a substance. So a region of low concentration. So when the particles move from a highly concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region, we say it's what? Diffusion. For an example, 
uh, before going to example, let me clear out of this one. We say the difference in concentration of particles in the two regions. The difference in concentration of particles. The difference in concentration of particles. The difference in concentration of particles between two regions between two regions between two regions is called concentration gradient is called concentration gradient so under concentration gradient for diffusion to take place. One side has to be highly concentrated and the other side has to be lowly concentrated so that the particles or molecules can move from a highly concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region. Let us demonstrate it. So on the diagram demonstration, I'll separate it into two. I'll name this part A and this side part B. So let us see the type of molecules that are on type A, on side A. On side A, we are having a lot of molecules or particles. But side B, we are having less particles. So if you can see, part A, it has, it's having what? A lot of what? Particles. But side B is having less particles. So the differences in the concentration between A and B, that's what we call concentration gradient. Whereby, now the particles are going to move from where they are highly concentrated to lowly concentrated. You can see on my arrow, on the arrow that I've drawn, the particles are moving from where they are highly concentrated to where they are lowly concentrated across the concentration gradient. When you talk about concentration gradient, that means that this side is highly concentrated, get it right, and the other side is lowly concentrated. So for diffusion to take place, there must be a concentration gradient whereby one side has to be highly concentrated and the other side has to be lowly concentrated in order for molecules to move from a concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region across semi-permeable membrane. Get it right. Across semi-permeable membrane. And we talk about semi-permeable membrane, we are referring to the properties of cell membrane. We say, number one, it is semi-permeable or selectively permeable. If this line here is a cell membrane, for it to enable particles to move from a highly concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region, it has to be selectively permeable or semi-permeable so that the only small particles or molecules will be able to move from region A to region B across the cell membrane. And I said it must be semi-permeable. So the differences in concentration of particles between two regions is called concentration gradient. Diffusion occurs. Diffusion occurs. We have three properties of matter. We have three properties of matter. That is solids, liquids, and gases. So, under these three properties of matter, diffusion can only take place in two, but not one. So, diffusion can only take place in liquid and gases, but not in what? In solids. So, diffusion can only take place in liquids, and gases, but not in, in solids. Diffusion can only take place in liquids and gases, but not in solids. The reason why diffusion cannot take place in solids, because in solids, particles are closely packed. But in liquids, particles are loosely packed, and in gases, particles are in a random motion. So diffusion can definitely take place there. 
So, diffusion can only take place in liquid gases, but not in what? In solid. But now between the two, the selected two, we have liquids and we have what? Gases. And it's here is only where the diffusion can take place. But between liquid and gases, we have one that the diffusion is higher than the other one. So diffusion is higher in gases than liquids. So diffusion can take place. Diffusion is higher, or the rate of diffusion is higher in gases than in what? In liquids. Because in gases, particles are in a random motion. So they are highly vibrating when they hit the molecule. So they are very, very under random motion. So the rate of diffusion also in gases will be higher compared to what? In liquids, where the particles are loosely packed. Uh, they are what? In a slower motion. They are not like what? Gases. So, we want to see the practical demonstration of diffusion. Practical demonstration of diffusion. How can we demonstrate diffusion? How do we know that diffusion has taken place? Or what can we use to determine the rate of what? Diffusion. That's what we want to discuss. So, practical demonstration of diffusion. Practical demonstration. of diffusion. Practical demonstration of diffusion. So we want to use, we want to do two practicals. Number one, we have to use potassium permanganate. And number two, we will use uh, visking tubing. So let us start with the number one, potassium permanganate, using potassium. permanganate. Permanganate. So, under potassium permanganate, it's just a crystal. Potassium permanganate is a, it's a purple in color. So when you mix or when you subject it to water or when you place it in water, the color of water will turn what? Purple. So under practical, we are being told, Put 50 cubic centimeter of water in a beaker. Put 50 cubic centimeter of water in a beaker. Put 50 cubic centimeter of water in a beaker. So here is our water. And this water, it is what? The volume is what? 50 cubic centimeter. 50 cubic centimeter. That's the first step. You put 50 cubic centimeter of water in a beaker. Number two, you select a large crystals of potassium permanganate and drop it through a tube. So when you identify a crystal of potassium permanganate, we take a straw or tube. You place it in the water. Then you drop a crystal of potassium permanganate. Crystal of potassium you drop in the crystal of what? Potassium permanganate. So here we have water which is 50 cubic centimeter and we have a glass tubing or a straw and this straw is only used to drop a crystal of what? Potassium permanganate. So that the potassium permanganate, permanganate can go at the base of what? Of the beaker. So the point number two, carefully remove the straw or tube without disturbing the crystal. So what you're going to do after dropping the crystal through using a straw, you carefully remove what? The straw or the glass tubing that you have used to place water, to place potassium permanganate inside the water. So at the end of the experiment, or after some times, like a 30 to 20 minutes, this is what you are going to get. The, our result should be 
like this. So what we are going to get at the end of the experiment is that uh, these are water in the beaker. So this is the beaker. This is the beaker. So inside the beaker, we had our what? Our water that was uh, 50 cubic centimeter. And here we are having what? Crystal of potassium permanganate. So what's going to happen? So what's going to happen that uh, the potassium permanganate will start dissolving from the base of uh, the beaker where it is highly concentrated to where it is slowly concentrated. So this is after, this is at the beginning of the experiment after five minutes, then at the end of the experiment, we expect to see such a, such a change. Now, you can see at the end of the experiment, we don't have a potassium crystal at the base of the, of, the, of the beaker. So we have evenly. So the one in circles are what? Particles of potassium permanganate. So at the end of the experiment, we say that Potassium particles are distributed in the in the beaker. So you can see at the end of the experiment, the potassium crystal has dissolved in water and the water color changed from colorless to purple. So here you say water changed from colorless to, to purple, sorry, to purple. Water changed from colorless to purple. That is now the exact diffusion that has taken place. You can see here was a crystal. The crystal started doing what? Dissolving this potassium crystal. Potassium crystal decided, started what? Dissolving. Then at the end of the experiment here, all potassium particles have evenly distributed in the beaker. Now the water has changed from what? Colorless to purple. That's the first demonstration of what? Diffusion. Number two, another, another demonstration we use a visking tubing. We can also use a visking tubing. visking tubing. And when using a visking tubing, we are going to have a such a experiment. So we have our beaker. So here we have water. Here we, we are not sorry. We are not going to use water. We are going to use a iodine solution. So this one will be our iodine solution. And inside the visking tubing, we are going to place starch solution. Starch solution. So here. We have placed a visking tubing. This is what we call visking tubing. This one here.
This is what we call visking tubing. And the visking tubing here acts as the cell membrane. It represents the cell membrane. The only difference between the visking tubing and the cell membrane is that the cell membrane is a, a living tissue, a, sorry, a living cell, is found on the living cell, while a, a visking tubing is what? Non-living. So here we have two solutions. Number one, we have starch solution inside the visking tubing, and we have iodine solution in the beaker. So the visking tubing containing starch solution is dipped inside the starch solution. So this is at the beginning of the experiment. At beginning. At beginning. Let us see at the end. At the end of the experiment. This is what you are going to have. So here, inside the visking tubing, we have what? Starch solution and in the beaker, in the beaker we have, sorry, inside the visking tubing we have starch solution. And in the beaker, we have iodine solution. In the beaker, we have iodine solution. So here is the iodine solution. Also, this one is iodine solution. But inside the visking tubing on A, we have a half visking tubing. The visking tubings have a half solution of what? Starch solution. But on the other side, on the visking tubing at the end of the experiment, the visking tubing is what? Full. If I can draw it well, if I can demonstrate it properly, to give clear differences. So this is our iodine solution. Iodine solution. And inside the visking tubing we have starch solution. We have starch solution. So I want you to observe the two diagrams carefully and get the differences. The first difference is that uh, in our first experiment, the visking tubing is full of iodine. Sorry, in the first experiment, the visking tubing is half filled with iodine or for the starch solution. You can see it is a half filled with what? Starch solution. But at the end of the experiment, the visking tubing has increased in what? In volume. And number two, the water level, the iodine, the iodine solution level reduced in B. This is, sorry, this is B. And this is A. This is at the end. This is at the end of experiment. So, at the end of the experiment, the visking tubing swelled up. So that means that the volume of the visking tubing has increased. Why? Because here, the starch solution inside the visking tubing and the iodine solution outside the visking tubing on the beaker. The concentration is different. So water moved, the starch moved, sorry, the iodine moved from a, low li a highly concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region through a semi-permeable membrane. What is the semi-permeable membrane here? In the visking tubing. So the solution in the beaker here moved from this, from the beaker into 
the visking tubing. And the level of the visking tubing, the, the volume of the visking tubing, the volume of the starch dead hot eh, increased. So you can see the iodine solution here in the beaker decreased, but here it was what more. Whereby it in the movement of water of uh, iodine solution moved from the beaker into the starch solution. Up to an extent it reached to an equilibrium where the, the two concentration was the same. Now, no more diffusion can do what can take place when you call it its isotonic solution, the solution of the same concentration. Yeah, but now here and here, they are having what? The same concentration and you call it isotonic concentration. So, as I wind up, uh, we also have another practical de demonstration of diffusion. This is the last one, using a perfume. If you're in a, a class or in a room, whereby one person is at the, end, at the end of the corner and the other one is at the end of the corner. The one at the end of the corner he opens up the bottle of uh, perfume. After some minutes, some seconds, I'll be able to feel it from here. Why? Because the particles will move from a highly concentrated region to a lowly concentrated region. That's how diffusion takes place. Thank you very much. That was my time. See you next time.